Welcome to the Molding Health Show. Our goal is to leverage the wisdom and experience of healthcare practitioners to set you on a path of self-discovery and healing. These insights, coupled with a multidisciplinary approach to each area of interest, should provide an invaluable resource to everyone looking for a better approach to health. In this episode, we speak to Dr. Tanya DeFerrari, a counseling psychologist based in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, about contextual therapy and how it differs from other modalities. Dr. Tanya DeFerrari, um, thanks for joining us on the show. It's great to have you here. Sure, it's awesome to be here. So I really, really want to thank you. You know, we, we go a little bit back, but I really want to thank you for, uh, you know, taking that up or taking the opportunity, but also uh, taking your time, you know, to be with us and just to talk about something. You know, Shaz and I have been doing this for a while now, but I don't think we've come across this particular topic. So, which is the amazing thing of doing this is because we learn tons and, uh, you know, we always put ourselves in the, in the picture of the, the parent or the person considering therapy. And, you know, they have oh. all of these lingo that, that unfortunately healthcare practitioners just know and no one else does. So we're trying to kind of demask that a little bit. Um, so in terms of your type of, uh, you know, what we're going to be talking about today is mm. contextual therapy. Um, yeah. So I'm not even going to try to say anything more. I mean, would you tell <laughs> us what, <laughs> would you tell us what that is? Sure. Um, you know, Oliver, I think, as you said, just to sort of bring that back, I think psychology can sometimes be quite like this sort of mystic thing for people, because it's like sometimes they are these terms and people will throw them around and it's like sometimes you kind of go, what does it mean? I, say, I think sometimes us in the profession go, what does it mean, you know? <laughs> so, and I think some of the terms and terminologies and stuff are very specific to different kinds of therapy. So I just sort of thought before I go into the contextual, sometimes it can be really important just for people to kind of understand um, just to almost contextualize the contextual, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so I think maybe a lot of us have heard of people like Sigmund Freud and those kinds of people as the guys that started art therapy. And I mean, that was, okay, there were a few before him, but you know, that was as early as sort of the, the 1850s already that psychology sort of came into being. And, and they were the group of psychologists that focused very much on sort of what well, was called psychoanalysis. And they sort of moved from focusing very on conscious thought to looking at unconscious thought. Okay, so just to break that down a bit, you know, so the conscious thought, it's the stuff we're aware of. So you and I right now, this is conscious thought we're in, well, hopefully <laughs> we're in the moment, we're aware of what's going on around us. Um, and, and then sort of people realize there's something called the pre-conscious. So that's the stuff that's happened recently, but it's not going on in our mind right now. But I could ask you, what did you have for breakfast? And you might have to like, think about it, but you could bring that up quite easily. It's sort of recent kind of stuff that's happened. And then there's the unconscious. And the unconscious, and they started realizing that there's a lot of stuff that's happened, even from when the child is, you know, really young and it starts forming their psyche. Um, and this stuff goes often unprocessed, often isn't even known to the person that it's going on. Um, and they started looking at that, that that's really important because even though we're not aware of it, it's sort of bubbling under the surface and really influencing our day to day. Um, and then there was a movement more to behavior therapies, sort of like the early 1900s. Um, a lot of us have heard of maybe Pavlov and his experiments with dogs. <laughs> um, and, and then there was a move more to the cognitive behavior therapy. So you can see how like over time, people have sort of been exploring all the different aspects of the person. Um, contextual therapy is, is quite a new-ish sort of approach. Um, and again, you think my surname is a, a mouthful. Um, <laughs> it was started by, um, he was actually Hungarian, a, a Hungarian psychiatrist who moved to America. Um, and his name was Ivan Bozomanye Naj. Wow. Right. So the last part of his surname is N A G Y. So Nagy, but it's pronounced Naj. So that's just how we refer to him. And he actually went over to um, America to then, um, he was part of the, pe the group that started family therapy. So okay. suddenly everyone had been focused on the individual and very much on the person. And then there was this move. And I mean, this is like now the like 1940s, I would say. We suddenly they were like, what about the system? What about, you know, a person isn't, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Where do they come from? How does that influence them? Um, 
so he started working with them and then it was in the 1980s that his sort of brand this contextual therapy came out and what I love about the contextual therapy is it kind of fits between individual therapy and family therapy meaning you can do both he realized you can't just do family, you can't just do individual. Well, this was his, you know, his way of thinking. So he's like, this sort of fits in between looking at the context, looking at the person, and it's a very intergenerational approach. So it focuses a lot on where you've come from, or not even just you, your parents, grandparents. Sometimes people go like, okay, how, how are we going so far back? But it's looking at those patterns. Um, but then also focusing on the individual. So it's not like I spend all my time just doing, you know, because sometimes people go, well, if if it's all about what my parents did, what about me? You know, so mm. yeah. So that's where contextual, just to get you sort of grounded where contextual kind of fits in the whole grand scheme timeline of psychology. Okay. I really like how you did that because I think that's already useful. I mean, if I think back at, uh, you know, some of the sessions we did, I don't think anyone's given us that almost landscape of, you know, how it all came to be. And I like how you put in, you know, the contextual uh, therapy part. What I also liked, because I I really had to research it, I'm I'm not kidding about this stuff, but uh, I, um, you know, I like that idea of it almost seemed like the, um, a, a much more holistic approach, you know, because you're taking various factors into consideration, and 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 I'm, I I believe in that because I mean, wh- who you are, I mean, it's definitely influenced by what you know the the environment you came in and the family values and things like that. Um, do you find though with with clients, I mean, do you have to explain this, or do they just get it? Does it is it like a natural feel to them? Uh, in terms of when they come yeah. into therapy? Um, I think it's a bit of both. I think what I've realized, what's so lovely about this approach is it really is, um, I can almost say multicultural in that like when I'm speaking about family, when I'm speaking about loyalties and delegations and sometimes words we may not use every day, but then I explain it, you know, and go like, you know, what's a way of being in your family that's being passed down? And we start looking at these patterns coming down. I almost liken it to a tapestry, you know, when you, um, in these beautiful castles, you know, you'll see this beautiful tapestry, it's this woven picture, but when you turn around to the back, you know, you see all the threads, and I say, those are my Sherlock Holmes moments where I'll spend quite a couple of sessions with a person trying to find those, like, where does it connect? How did we get to where we are? And I think that for me, I've seen no matter really who I'm speaking to, you know, even if it's a teenage or younger child through to like some of the like adults, it doesn't really matter who you are. People go, oh, yeah, wow. Oh, my gosh. I did not realize that these patterns and then they suddenly like, look where it came from, you know? Um, so, yeah. I like that. I mean, I, I really like how you explained even that. So, I mean, obviously, you know, this is your academic background coming in as well, but uh, <laughs> I mean, you have a good Literally. way of explaining it. <laughs> yeah, you've got a good way of explaining these things to us. But uh, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. And, yeah. you know, speaking to someone recently and, you know, she, uh, you know, when we talk about religion as well, you know, most of them, yeah. and, you know, we can argue, but uh, oh, not argue, but, you know, chat about it, but, you know, they, they have that common thread, you know, around them. And so when you say this, you know, most families, um, you know, have a common thread around, you know, how they mm. want to want better for their children, you know, they want better for the next generation, yes. they want better for themselves. And, you know, there's that constant strife. But the fact that you hold that together on a, you know, on a therapy methodology and basis is actually yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. Um, Shaz, on your side, um, is there anything around this that you would like to ask? Yes. I was just going to say, you know, based on what Tanya had said there about the tapestry and the things connecting, that also seems to go back to almost that genetic memory, you know, where things are passed from generation to generation. And if you take, let's take, you know, Native American Indians, they instinctively know, or Native Africans instinctively know, don't go near a puff adder or don't eat that berry. That That's almost passed down through genetics so it makes sense that there are certain psychological things that are also then passed down in the way a person acts and behaves and is that what contextual therapy is really looking at you know what is that history that's brought you to here 
Yeah, Shaz, I think the way you've explained it, I mean, that is really it. You know, it's just looking at how, how it gets passed on and what the things are that, that do get passed on. You know, and I know it isn't really a question that you've, but just sort of asking, you know, what happens in contextual therapy? Um, and, you know, I'll often spend a session or sometimes up to three months, uh, depending on what the person's coming for. Um, and we'll, we'll start with something called a genogram. And we all had to do something like this when we were at school, you know, the family tree. <laughs> and where you had to like, often it was in the shape of a tree and you would like go home and then have to ask parents like, you know, who are my grandparents really? And you know, what's been going on? Um, and so I will, I will spend some time. It's, it's often not as colorful in that way. It's circles and squares. And we sort of represent the different family members. And we go back as far as we can, usually to grandparents, but sometimes people know their great grandparents and that can be so eye opening, you know? Um, and then just looking, like you said, you know, what are those things that have been brought through, you know? So I might ask a question, and I'm using a random, um, there's no like relevance to the surname, but uh, if it's a Smith, I'll go, okay, so tell me on, you know, granny's side or on dad's side, okay? Um, and if you had to answer the question for me, a Smith is always, or a Smith must, right? And then that's how I sort of get them to start looking and we'll do specific like, like relationship lines and stuff. And, you know, they'll come up with things with like, you know, I mean, we really discuss it in detail, but it'd be maybe a Smith must always be strong. Um, and then and then we'll look into that. Where does that come from? And a lot of these are positives, you know, or a lot of them are in the intention behind the kind of delegation or whatever's being passed on from the parent to the child, the intention is good. You know, often it's because a parent maybe didn't have an opportunity and they're trying to give that opportunity to their child or whatever it is. But then we look at, okay, so what's the positive being positive of being strong? But also what can, what can be, what can get you down about having to be strong all the time? What does it mean in your life when you always have to be strong? And so that's just for me the really exciting way of seeing how this sometimes comes down. Sometimes you see it go all the woman, all the way down, like the one side of the family tree, you know? Um, and, and that's what I love about this. So you're working with what's come before you, but then you bring it into the now. And I love that it's an approach where you're not then focused always just on the past, because sometimes people go, okay, you know, come on, <laughs> like, what about me here now? And then we look at, okay, what, what, what are you doing with that now? How is it impacting your life now? Um, and then sometimes I even do ones where if, it, if someone, their future children, even if they don't have children, I'll look at how do you want to change that? And what do you not want to pass on? Um, so that's really exciting for me and just a very different way of sometimes doing, doing things. I love that. I mean, <laughs> that again explains it so well. But so, so if I understand that, so if someone is going through a difficult time and they're almost being trying, they're almost being forced to be strong, but they can't, you know, for whatever reason. So then this helps them understand why there's that, that, that inherent need to be strong in this moment, although they physically can't. Is that yes. how you would almost explain it as well? Yeah, Oliver, that's a really good way of summarizing it. It's, it's sort of looking at how sometimes we, we, we're doing these things and we, we don't know why. We don't know where it comes from. But, and it's sometimes just for the person to have that moment and that clarity of going like, oh, wow, oh, yes. You know, and then we look at it sometimes as a loyalty. And loyalty, the word loyalty in contextual therapy is a little bit different to sometimes how we might understand it. It's sort of like often they can be quite hidden. And those can sometimes be a little bit dangerous because it's, I'll ask the person, you know, when was there a time where you, you, your brain was saying do this and you just keep going back and doing the same thing over and over again? Why do you keep getting stuck in those patterns? I think we've, <laughs> we all have some of those. <laughs> I'm yeah. seeing nodding. So, yes. um, and those hidden loyalties, it's just to then look at its really deeply entrenched ways of being in families and um, that sometimes maybe serve purposes in the past, but aren't, aren't necessarily helpful or, or, or relevant now. And it's to un unpack that and bring that to light because then the person knows and then they can actually go, okay, how am I going to change this? Because it's only once you've identified something 
that you can then go, okay, what, what do I need to do? What, what is my role now going forward? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, there's definitely nodding because uh, that's the thing that amazes me about psychology is that you point out the circles that we run through. And I think everyone does it, you know, whether, you know, you're a psychologist or you're not, but, but we, we have these circles. But as you said, you know, you, you can't pick them up yourself, but you just know you keep on doing the same nonsense. Yeah. And it's un until someone points it out. It's like, okay, you're doing that because of this. And unless you can understand those triggers, yeah. um, you know, you don't know how to change it. So I really love yeah. the fact that you do that. Um, yeah. But coming, uh, you know, what's always intrigued me, so I dream a lot. I mean, uh, you know, it's like I always do. But um, they say lots of the unconscious is, is trapped in the dreams. Is, is that, um, I mean, how, so maybe the other way of asking this is, how do you unlock the unconscious? Because the unconscious is, you know, something that, as you said, you know, we don't even know yeah. it exists. Is there a way <laughs> or a secret yeah. method that you do this? <laughs> <laughs> now you want me to give away all our trade secrets, eh? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think so So that's just to then, then bring in what's so nice about the contextual approaches and what Nudge sort of said is that um, the contextual theory, he almost saw there were like four different dimensions, you know, when you're working with a person. And so he took a lot of the therapies and the ideas coming before him and he sort of incorporated it into his approach. Um, and so, so in that, even though this isn't always necessarily focused, although there is a very psychoanalytic background, remember, like I said, Freud, so he definitely does focus on the unconscious. So to just answer that question, um, I would, I would then, what Nudge liked is that you could integrate different theories. So I will then often, if I'm working with someone with dreams, um, there are various techniques from Gestalt therapy. Um, or some of the other therapies that I will actually bring in with into the practice that I do. So as he as he would say, is like when you're working with a person, you'll always start on the first level, which is facts. You know, we've got to get your age, male or female, whatever, like those are facts. How many, you're the third child. And then you say, but don't get stuck there. Because sometimes as therapists, we can get very stuck on just getting like details, but we don't actually. And he said, then you must move on to what he saw as the second level is looking at um, more individual psychology. And there he said, um, the important thing is to look at how the persons, what their motivations are, their personality, how they've internalized things and stuff like that. Um, and I think that would be a lot than what you're speaking about there with, with the unconscious. So I don't get stuck always just having to then do intergenerational stuff. Although, I mean, there would be a lot, I mean, there's a lot of research also on, like you say, um, and I think what Chaz was saying as well, sort of dreams and like preparing yourself for, for life, you know, I'm not going to go into that, but yeah. So how do we, how do we get into that unconscious? Um, if I'm then working with some of the other techniques, I would probably use a gestalt technique, like an empty chair technique, um, or there's another technique. Um, so I've been trained by a um, Dutch psychologist from the, well, from the Netherlands, um, Dr. Art Nevenbroek, and one of the techniques he uses is called via the other side. And so it's really getting the person to sometimes become out of their cognitive mind, because if I'm working with you in your cognitive mind, it can shut things down. And that's where resistance happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, often when I'm asking a person a question, they'll be like, I don't know, you know, and I can see. And I remember resistance is protecting the most vulnerable part of yourself. So sometimes if you're just doing plain cognitive back and forth conversation, we can con we control it. We don't get to the deeper levels almost. So doing an empty chair technique, and I, I mean, my clients sometimes, <laughs> they, they know it's coming. They're like, Tanya, do we have to? <laughs> so I'll be like, say, for example, um, I can either integrate it with parts therapy so say, for example, that example I gave you, we've identified that this person has this very strong need to be strong, and it comes down from the father's side. Sometimes we will actually go into and go, okay, label that, give that strong part of yourself a name. You know, so either they'll just call it my strong part or they'll call it Larry. And then we'll go and I'll actually, <laughs> I'll make them... Um, you actually make them move chairs. And then I actually do a technique where I will then speak to that specific part only. And all of a sudden you're moving away from the very, because it's, it's such a like 
almost bewildering experience sometimes, I suppose, because they were like, we're speaking, do I have multiple multiple parts? Well, no, we all have different parts to us. And then I will go into that. And sometimes that helps a person tap into more the unconscious. I also then use um, various dream, the stealth dream therapy techniques. You know, we will like maybe actually go, we, you jot down the dream and there's different ways of doing that. Or I grab my adults as much as my children and go take them into the playroom and do some sand therapy. Um, and we do, we do play therapy. And play therapy, sand tray therapy are one of the best ways to actually get in. Because when you're playing, you're not, you're not, you be, it's, it's, that's just getting completely into the, the unconscious there. So, yeah. Sure. Okay. That's actually, uh, uh, there must be a first as well, because I haven't heard play therapy with adults for, <laughs> but you know, when you go to the beach, you know, you're busy like playing around yeah. in the sand and it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's, you know, one of the most mesmerizing things to do, you know, and it's, I think the closest, you know, adults come to like doing play yeah. therapy again, you know, for yeah. the most part, which is, uh, which is actually really cool <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you actually <laughs> employ that. But uh, you know, you'll have to come to PE sometime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does have a beach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if that answers sort of the question, but I think it's hmm. just what's so nice about this approach, like I said, is that it gives me the underpinning of understanding the person. So, I, have, I use the contextual approach to understand people, but it gives me a lot of freedom to be able to draw them. Some, it's not prescriptive. You know, I can sit with a person in the moment. I can decide, okay, this is happening. They're actually going to benefit from this. So I can use a bit of cognitive behavior therapy or gestalt therapy or whatever the person needs. And I really love that, that it's not sort of like, as they sort of say, a cookie cutter approach where I'm trying to put a person into a mold and like trying to make them fit the therapy. I let mm. the therapy for them you know I, I like also what you uh, i see shows as a question as well but uh, you know what, what i uh, what i like about that is almost like you have these tools and you know using a tool and also giving um giving cognizance for the fact that everyone is an individual and you know you're all going to struggle with different things and you need the right tool to yeah. suit the person at that stage uh, because what you said earlier which was very very interesting as well because the human mind is so powerful that it just shuts off things, you know, whether I want to tell you or I can't, you know, uh, whether I want to or not, you know, it's almost like the mind has blocked that out. And, you know, to be able to, to get to that part is, it must be quite challenging. And the fact that you have these tools, even the one that we're talking about now in terms of contextual therapy is, is pretty powerful um, to actually know as well, you know, for someone that wants to consider coming for therapy to know that actually it's not just you coming and talking for 45 minutes or 50 or 60 minutes you know it's actually we we are trying to help you in in a mm -hmm. way where we we do have these tools uh, yeah. it's almost like diagnostic stuff uh, which is yeah. actually really cool yeah. Shans? yeah um i was just going on what tanya was saying there about you know, the, the biggest thing of contextual therapy is it's not just looking at the individual or one part of the individual, it's looking at the whole. And I was thinking to an interview we did a while back with a social worker who was saying a very similar concept. You know, it's one thing to treat an individual, but where they come in is they treat from the social aspect as well, because you are very much defined by your social surroundings, and that does in its own way affect who you are. So to be able to bring that into therapy and say, okay, well, yeah, I'm struggling with A or B and to go beyond, you know, A or B is what's on the surface, but what's actually sitting behind that? I think it's just amazing that these tools are out there and we're no longer just looking at okay, well, you're sad, let's treat the sad. We're looking beyond that and saying, okay, well, why are you sad? What could be causing this? Where did this come from? So I think it's an amazing step forward into the therapeutic you know, world. And I think it's going to also take away a lot of the stigma of I'm seeing a therapist. You know, The more yeah. people who are realizing that seeing a therapist isn't just to deal with this problem, but it's also that holistic approach and that's, I definitely think, where contextual therapy seems to be playing a lot more of a, it's not you, let's look at everything to see where that could be from. 
Yeah. Shaz, I think, you know, what you said there, it's it's so relevant to how I work. And, you know, like I have people who come in and, and say they're experiencing some depression or something. This approach, and I always say to them, this approach, because sometimes they'll be like, well, why, why do we need to do this? You know, I'm depressed. Why do you want to? And then I say, but you sitting here depressed and Mary sitting here depressed are two different things. The reason why you got there um and I don't want to I'm not just going to like go okay you and just then treat this blanket depression I want to know where it comes from I want to know yours I want to know where like you specifically um so I think that's really important yeah and you know what, what I really like because uh you know Shaz is referencing episodes but we were speaking to and occupational therapist yesterday and you know she when she was talking about sensory integration and she was saying you know we almost like give them the life skills and what I'm hearing you say is that because the next time the depression bout kind of comes up at least the person knows that these were the triggers you know leading up to that and you know maybe they yeah. seek more intervention or something like that um, is that something that you find coming through from a mm-hmm. you know the work that yeah. you're doing definitely like I think I've seen you know people that have sort of walked quite a long journey with me sometimes you know where it's over a couple of years um and it, that doesn't mean that they're in therapy for three years it means you know they'll have come to therapy for a couple of months um and then we'll go off and we'll go use those tools and maybe they have experienced another trauma or something happens you know life happens um but what I've noticed is it's there's it's a, they're at a very different starting place when they do come back for a couple of top-up sessions whether it be three or four, or again, come for a month or two or whatever. It's just coming with a very different understanding. We're definitely never back, you know, all the way where we were when we started because there is this understanding. And I think often they'll come and they'll be like, look, I'm using this, but this was just so new. I didn't know how to bring this in now or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe we should have started with something like this, but if I was coming through and is this, I mean, I'm just making the assumption, but, uh, you know, if I come through and I say, you know, I, w- I want to book a session and you say, you know, I, I primarily use contextual therapy. I'm not sure if you actually say that. Um, mm-hmm. What would someone almost, how would you explain it to someone when they're coming in? Or, or do you actually do that? Or do you just carry no, on? I do. Yeah, no, okay, I do. Cool. I think a lot of people, by the time they've come to me, have maybe looked at my website or something like that. So often people will say, hey, I chose you because I've read your write up and this sounds interesting. So often, often, not always, they will have a bit of an idea of, you know, me just a little bit from looking at that. Um, but definitely. So I'll spend the first session where I do orientate them to what we're going to be doing, because I think it is so important. I think for me, therapy, I'm, I'm not very good at making it this very elusive, like I'm sitting here on my pedestal and I'm a psychologist. Like my, my clients know I'm, I'm a person, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I will sometimes use relevant examples and stuff, even for my own life sometimes, if, if necessary. Um, but it's, it's so it, I think what I love about this approach is it just, it's really just so real. You know, it's like, so I'll sit the person down, they're part of the process with me. I'll explain it. So I'll say, you know, um, it, and it depends, you know, like if someone's coming for a trauma, I'm not going to then spend three sessions doing a genogram with them. I'm going to do trauma therapy, you know, so it's like I will also meet the person where they're at. Um, so sometimes if a person's coming for a specific thing, we will focus on that first and then they can decide from there if they want to carry on or, or whatever. But if a person's coming more for personal growth or, you know, because there are different reasons why people come into a therapy session, you know, often we think it's because, you know, it's something horrible's happened sometimes people are just like hey I've realized I've got a lot of patterns in my life I want to try and figure out what's going on I don't really have a specific thing I want to work on I just want to want to work on me um and those are interesting sessions as well because that's then I'll explain the context I'll say hey look you know this is looking at intergenerational stuff and exactly like I've explained to you just kind of let them ask questions get comfortable with it you know, sometimes I'll have people who say, hey, I, I really want to come more for cognitive behavior therapy sessions. You know, they want to do brief short-term therapy. And then I do that, you know. Um, I also do EMDR, which is the uh, movement desensitization um, reprocessing technique. You know, so that's more for trauma stuff. So, um, like I said, I'm not going to force um, anything on anyone if they're going, look, this is specifically why I'm here. 
Although I think that my tech shop probably does sort of sneak its way through with me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know, when, I mean, like, and again, I'm, I'm by no, you know, I'm not anyway close to the profession uh, personally, but, you know, the, what, what I always find like, from this psychodynamic approach, you know, where there's, you know, you go through maybe years of like the therapist not even, you know, speaking to you, you know, just kind of understanding how things are working internally and stuff like that. But I've always gravitated more towards the CBT type, you know, approach. And, you know, where it's like almost like real. And as you said, you know, it's a real person and, you know, we're going to go through this together. Um, that's just from a personal approach. And um, I think what Shan said, which is actually very important, is that I think we living in a world now where people are starting to see that therapy could be used to unlock a better version of themselves. And sometimes, you know, it's not, yeah, it's not because they're going through trauma. It's just, they want to be a better person. Uh, I know personally, I mean, it's helped me tremendously just, you know, understanding how uh, corporate works, how entrepreneurship works, how people work. I mean, it makes you a better person. We, these are the type of things that, you know, you don't get trained in school. You don't get, get trained as a baby. You don't get trained as a, as a graduate. It's just you, you kind of assume that you know the, these things, but most people don't because you carry so much of baggage around that, uh, yeah. And, and you know what I'm, what I'm hearing, and I love what you said so far, it's, it's almost like who you are is everything before and you need to understand why you're making those decisions. And, and this, what you bring into the table gives you a way where you can actually unlock that, which is pretty cool. Um, so I do, um, you know, from, from our perspective, I mean, I think we covered the topic really well, but I do wanna ask, uh, is there anything that we missed uh, before we wrap it up and, you know, ask shares for closing thoughts around this? Um, that we should have asked you and we didn't, uh, or that you, you know, someone that kind of comes up a lot in terms of people looking to do therapy with you? Um, I don't know. I think we went into quite a lot. Yeah. I think the thing with the, the contextual approach of therapy, I mean, you know, our, our level one workshop, it's three days, and that's just getting the person to understand the the basic fundamental concepts of it. So, I mean, I can talk to you for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you should ask such open-ended questions. Um, uh, no, but yeah, I think, <laughs> Oliver, I just think that the main thing about this approach is just looking at, you know, so so one of the things that Nat really wanted to, to explore was getting a person to understand everything that's come before them, but then also bring it into the now and to, to take... Um, so to, to look at those past injustices and, and imbalances that have happened, he, he speaks a lot about give and take. I mean, that was his book, give and uh, Between Give and Take, um, and looking at, you know, the reciprocity between relationships and how sometimes that does fall apart, either because a generation before, you know, couldn't give to the child, the child then came into being an adult and kind of wasn't able to then give either. And, and so it looks at all of those dynamics as well. Um, and I think that the really important thing that you mentioned, just to, to say again, what Maj actually said was, you know, his whole, the main concept was healing through meeting. And so that was his thing. It was subject, subject, two people meeting and then, you know, trying to figure out the stuff together. So, yeah, I think that would be about it. Mm. Shaz, um, so I, I did say Shaz, uh, one more, but I, I, that that point that you just mentioned about the generational stuff, you know, even on a personal level, you know, if I think of my my grand's generation, you know, it was all about just like surviving, you know, my mom's generation was more about, you know, even if you ask her now, you know, she's like, you know, she always did stuff for her children. And so yeah. that's kind of our new drive, you know, that's the reason we're doing some of these shows as well. It's almost like you you need to create we call it generational wealth, but you almost like create something now for the next generation and you become better for the next generation. And, you know, it's, it makes me really excited to see that there's actually, there's actually an academic background or there's, there's mm -hmm. professionals that are actually helping people on the same thing because, yeah. you know, it's, and because, you know, you don't just become successful on your own. I think that's the part that, you know, most people don't realize is that, you know, there's so many people that have, held up the thread in your case you know when you use the analogy of the embroidery you know there's so many strings in the background that you don't even see it you know it could be a simple conversation it could be a, a mentorship for even two days but all of that makes you the person that you are 
um, which is which is really really interesting. Um, but I'm sure you have some really you know interesting clients as well, you know, because you're going through that stuff, um, which is which is quite nice to hear. Shes, on your side, in terms of closing. So I just wanted to say, you know, I, I liked what you said about it's it's about bringing the past into the now and dealing with it now, but it's also about building that path for the rest of the journey. You know, the, the whole concept is life is a journey and where we are now, we're still carrying on from the generation before's journey. So to be able to bring that into the now, deal with it, action it, use those that learning and carry on the journey gives us the ability to then bring hopefully better um, habits and stuff into the next generation so that they are better equipped and bet and are able to move smoother through where they need to be instead of carrying on with the repressive stuff <coughs> from being, you know, Scottish in Scotland and, you know, hate the English. So, you know, I think some people do. They carry that, Yeah. you know, if you look at things like family feuds, they eventually reach a point where nobody knows why these two families are fighting, but we know that we must hate them. And, and you know, at some point, the next generation's kind of going to want to go, actually, I don't want to hate them, but how do we move past it? And I think that's where this seems to play such a huge role is, fix up what happened before and use that to make sure that we improve it moving forward yeah and i think what both of you said there's so important like uh, the word oliver used was like that sort of passing on this wealth going forward and i think wealth isn't we often think about it as money you know but i mean i think this is also these skills and these tools that we can then learn and, and these ways of being we can change and pass on. I think that is worth more if we can break these, these injustices and, and pass on different ways of being. I think that is worth so much more um, mm. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, and so just to collaborate, definitely wealth is not money in our sense uh, because I think money you can always make back. Uh, but there's a certain sense of, you know, like even what our, our daughter told you, she's 14, but you know, even now, you know, we start, I started teaching her the concept of how does she save and budget? And, you know, I, I learned this concept from someone I worked with and he said, you know, he half lived what he earned. And it always, you know, reminds me of that. And, you know, so what he would do is, you know, if he earned 10,000 rands, he almost assumed that he didn't have 10,000, he had 5,000. And if you look at how we struggle as adults, you know, with finances, I mean, it's just crazy. It doesn't matter who you are, what you earn, everyone struggles with similar things. And it's because we never got taught that, you know, so I never got taught, you know, as a, as, as a, as a child growing up, this is how you treat money and, and respect it and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, for the next generation, which is our kids, you know, at least they get taught that. There's no guarantee that she's going to do it, but at least she knows. <laughs> you know, she yeah. knows it because the reality is difficult. Um, yeah. But I really, really want to thank you. I love this this content. I love the the you know what you said, and I love the fact that there's assistance for people that are looking for this, um, you know, in their lives. And I think um, we'll include your your details in the show notes. And also, we live in a in a world, although you mentioned Port Elizabeth, I'm sure you do take clients across the country, if not the world. Yeah. So um, yeah, we'll include your show notes. And if, if this resonated to anyone, I mean, I think um, we know we'll definitely see that those results in terms of appointments. So uh, thanks very much for giving us this opportunity to speak to you. It's an absolute pleasure. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. As always, stay tuned and we'll speak to you in the next episode. Yeah.